Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Um, if you'd like to maybe just introduce yourselves um, and tell the audience a bit about where you might stand on the issue. Would you like yeah. me to go first? Sure. I'm Terence Stevenson. I'm a professor of child health at University College London and I'm chair of the General Medical Council, which regulates a quarter of a million doctors across the whole of the United Kingdom. Uh, I've worked in the NHS all my life and I've been treated by the NHS. Even in the last year, I, have a, I had uh, four screws, a little bit like this is a, this is a screw. I had four screws that were actually made of platinum put in my spine in a five-hour operation. I didn't have it in a private hospital. I had it in my NHS hospital, so I guess that tells you something. I've walked the walk. Uh, Anita Charlesworth, and I'm uh, an economist, um, and I currently work for an independent uh, foundation called the Health Foundation. Um, I've spent most of my career in healthcare um, and, and associated, and um, as part of that, I spent 10 years at the Treasury. So, good evening. I'm Chris Ham, Chief Executive of the King's Fund, another independent charitable foundation concerned with uh, healthcare. I spent my career working in various universities. I've got a chair at the University of Birmingham in health policy and management. I spent some time working in government as director of strategy in the Department of Health and uh, I've worked on issues to do with the NHS throughout my career so very much looking forward to our debate this evening. Thank you. Um, so, jumping straight into questions for myself then, um, first taking a look at the funding that the NHS currently receives. Do you think that increased funding will help solve the issue or do we need to delve deeper and look at um, problems of efficiency? Shall I <coughs> yeah, go, go for that? So, um, we spend, public and private, um, about 10% of our national income as a country on healthcare. On the NHS, we spend 2,200, each of you spends 2,200 pounds a year, the equivalent of, on the NHS. <coughs> so, uh, so the NHS is, has and is a consumer of a huge amount of, uh, of money. Um, that amount of money has increased um, very uh, significantly since the NHS was founded. So the NHS was founded in 48. The assumption when the NHS was founded was that obviously, whilst it might be expensive at the beginning to provide healthcare, if you would make people better <coughs> and tackle uh, illness and disease, actually it would kind of pay for itself. What we have discovered, as all advanced health economies have discovered, <coughs> is that actually healthcare is is one of those things that as societies get richer, they choose to spend more on. So um, whilst we were spending less than 4% of GDP back in uh, 1948, we're now up at 10% of GDP. But every country is in that uh, position. You know, we're a bigger country with more people. We're aging medicine with your fantastic screws in your back can do ever more wonderful uh, things for us. Um, so it is an enormous challenge to spend that money well, because obviously if you have 10% of your GDP and you don't spend that well, that's an incredible drag on a society economically, but also it's a huge wasted opportunity to, to, to provide good health care. But however well we spend that money, it's almost impossible to see how we can buck the trend of every other country and the fundamentals of healthcare and continue to spend more. Um, <clears throat> the, there's an um, economist, Baumol, who, who, who talks a lot about, you know, why does healthcare get ever more expensive and computers get cheaper? <clears throat> and he, as he points out, in some senses, um, it's n it might seem like a problem that healthcare gets more expensive, but as long as your economy is growing, yeah, and other things are getting cheaper, yeah. So, <clears throat> so if food and computers are getting cheaper, they make they create that creates the headroom for healthcare to cons to, to 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 grow, um, <clears throat> uh, and so I think um, we are try we're trying to avoid politics. Essentially, is trying to avoid this reality. And all the political parties really are trying to think, 
<coughs> we want the NHS, we want everyone to have good access to healthcare, but we don't want to really <coughs> um, address the fact that if that is the case, we are going to have to pay more. <coughs> and it's a really efficient and sensible way to organise that payment through taxation. So I think we need both. We need more money and we need to be more efficient and more productive. If you've been reading the newspapers or if you saw the BBC 10 o'clock news last night, they visited North Tees Hospital and spent the weekend in the A&E department and it told a graphic story of the pressures and the crisis engulfing the NHS this winter, partly because social care funding has been cut and that's adding to the burden on our hard-pressed doctors and nurses and other staff really struggling during the course of January, as we always expect them to struggle because this is entirely predictable. There will be winter pressures and it will have an effect on A&E departments, on GPs, on other parts of the healthcare system. So we must put more money in as a country. Uh, we value the NHS highly. 10% of our gross domestic product sounds a lot, but it's not. We're pretty much at the average for developed countries if you look at the statistics. And in the last seven years, the coalition government and now the current government have only put a small amount extra in every year when the long-term trend has been about 4% extra after inflation going into the NHS. It's no surprise, given that uh, period of austerity, that the NHS finds itself in the position it's in. I think many people, most people perhaps, would argue for, for more money. But that doesn't mean to say we can't be more efficient. There is huge variability between hospitals, between doctors, in how they treat patients. A lot of evidence that we could do more with what we've got if we were to reduce that variation. And also an important debate about sometimes we intervene too much in the wrong circumstances. Think of end of life care, when often there are heroic attempts to provide good medical care, <coughs> when palliative care, and supporting people to die in the place of their choice, often their own home, would be a much better alternative. So it doesn't have to be a choice. Going back to the question, we need more money and we need to be more efficient. So as a, as a practicing doctor uh, and chair of the GMC, I have to acknowledge that the NHS is under as much pressure as I've ever seen it. We, we read stories every day about, that, about things that happen that we would be unhappy if they're happening to one of our family or loved ones. But we mustn't lose sight of the fact the, the NHS treats a million people every 36 hours. And so only a small fraction of those make headlines in the news and newspapers. And most people being treated by the NHS in the last 24 hours and the next will be treated on time and treated well. But the facts don't lie. You've heard about 10% of GDP. So if we compare ourselves to, say, Sweden or Germany, who spend 2% more, that equates to about 40 billion pounds more per annum, year on year, tw about 20 billion for each percentage point. And if you look at some other metrics of the UK, we have one of the fewest doctors per thousand population of the OECD countries. We're in the bottom fifth. We have among the fewest numbers of hospital beds per thousand population in the OECD rankings. Those beds were among the highest occupancy. Right now, they're probably over 95%, but averaged over probably 85% occupancy. That's in the top four of the OECD. So, so there is huge pressure, and the resources only go so far. But what I would say, I'm not an economist, unlike these two, I'm a doctor, but correlation doesn't always mean causation. And simple spend, to my mind, doesn't always correlate with, if you look at the Commonwealth Fund, uh, in, in the, the United States, Commonwealth in New England, where they rank different international healthcare systems every year. Uh, the NHS consistently comes out in the top two for fairness, value for money, and equity. Does a lot w worse on outcomes. But I think that's something to, to treasure, that fact that we have a universal healthcare system based on not ability to pay, free at the point of delivery, but based on clinical need when I treat people. I'm treating them, prioritizing them on need, not on ability to pay. And I think that's something that has huge, huge value. 
I think just touching on something you said there, and feel free to jump in as well. You said that we currently lack um, doctors within the system. Why do you think that problem exists? So that's a really interesting question for me because the General Medical Council really has no role to play in um, affecting the demand on healthcare services, which you've heard is going up, and we have no role to play in the delivery of healthcare services. Where our real locus is, is in the workforce. Since for the last 150 years, we oversee the training of all of tomorrow's doctors. So why do we have a problem? Well, we have a quarter of a million doctors on our register, but if you were Florence Nightingale walking around the National Health Service tomorrow, uh, on average in the United Kingdom, about a third of those doctors will not be UK graduates. Historically, many of them came from our former or present Commonwealth countries. And in the last decade, equal numbers from Europe. So last year, something like 1,500 specialists came from the European Union to this country. So we've always been dependent on doctors from overseas. That's going to probably get more critical with Brexit. You've seen that with nursing already. Um, so that's, that's one problem. We have a loss of morale. So we have young doctors leaving the UK to go to Australia and New Zealand. And we have older doctors of my age generation retiring earlier and, or retiring and not coming back. So there's a huge thing for us, and one of the things we want to do is to support doctors to be the uh, fence at the top of the cliff, stopping them falling off instead of the ambulance at the bottom, picking them up. And we're doing a lot to help doctors in their work, helping whistleblowers, helping doctors in difficulty, and we're going to do a big piece of work next year on the mental health, or, or this year now, 2018, on the mental health and well-being of doctors, because we think that is a factor. Stress is driving people to leave the profession. Mm. I mean, there, there are more doctors working in the NHS today than there ever have been. So we hear talk of shortages, and that's a real, real issue and a real challenge for the NHS, but uh, against the background in the last 20 years of ever-increasing number of hospital specialists and GPs. I think there are a couple of other factors at work, aren't there? Uh, we did a study, let me just talk briefly about um, GPs. We did a study at the King's Fund of uh, newly qualified doctors choosing to go into general practice and their um, aims for their career over the next 5, 10, 15 years. Only a small minority envisaged being full-time clinically involved in general practice over that period of time. We have a new generation of people going into medicine who have very different attitudes and expectations than, dare I say it, Terence when he qualified and thought about his career um, in future. Newly qualified doctors want more variety. They will often choose to work part-time in medicine, and even if they work part-time clinically, they may want to do research, they may want to be involved in education, they may want to pursue other interests. This applies to men, and to women equally from what we found. And I think the NHS has been very slow to recognise these societal changes. And what I've described doesn't just apply to medicine, it applies to many professions and many different occupations. The history of workforce planning is very sad, indeed tragic, I would say, in the NHS. We've never, those responsible for it, got it right in terms of knowing what the likely need is in future and making sure there are sufficient doctors, nurses and other clinicians in training to meet that need. In fact, the sad fact is in the last what, six, seven years, there have been cuts which are now being restored by increasing training places to begin to deal with this really important and challenging shortage. So thinking much more broadly, not just in healthcare terms, but in societal terms about our current and future workforce has to be part of that solution. Can, can I come in on that? Because uh, there are a couple of things that I, 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 I want to pick up on. One is that I think historic, I mean, we, we have been dire at workforce um, planning I I in the UK. And one of the things that I think has been a real problem with that is that we have been uh, really worried about training too many people. And if you trained too many people, one, it would cost you a lot. It's what, quarter of a million plus to train a doctor, 90,000 pounds to train um, a, a nurse. So um, we've been worried, and I say this as a former treasury person worried about how much it would cost 
Um, then obviously there is an issue about if you uh, train more than you need, what will happen to them? And at, 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 will people be unemployed? Which is just bad economics, yeah? Because <clears throat> it assumes that actually in medicine and healthcare and nursing where you take incredibly clever, well-motivated people with really good intellectual skills and really good social skills, that if they can't do that exact thing, they can't do anything, which you know makes no sense at all. <clears throat> um, and one of the things that we want to be is a world leader in life sciences. And uh, I worked for a period in pharmaceuticals, and one of the biggest things that is a problem for the pharmaceutical industry in doing more in the UK is not actually the price we pay, pay for drugs, it's their ability to get the skilled workforce that they need, and, and much of the training that you could organise in healthcare would provide a lot of the transferable skills uh, that they need. And then you also have to say, of course, this is one of those areas where if you look at the short-term public purse, but you also look then at the role of existing professionals, you know, straight economics would tell you that if you constrain supply, you put up your price. So it makes you, as the employee, uh, the professional gives you a very powerful position. So there's, and the patient, and especially the future patient's voice is very quiet in that. So I think we need a real wholesale shift in our thinking from being fearful of, um, of, of oversupply to really understanding that not training enough undersupply has massive hidden costs and impact across our system in terms of, uh, of, of quality. Um, the other thing that I think is really important just to, to, uh, to, to say one thing is, is that the, the other thing we do is still have very rigid boundaries between different uh, staff groups and a lot of that um, very controlled uh, legislatively. So we tried to establish some new roles to meet these shortages, but um, for at least one of them, the physician associate, we're still waiting for Parliament to find enough time to give them the range of, um, of prescribing uh, and uh, powers that they would need to really make that um, a role that can flourish and be useful for the uh, individuals. It, it, I don't understand how in a, a modern adaptive world it can make sense for what an employee can and can't do to be the subject actually of legislation in the Houses of Parliament. That just seems fundamentally uh, <clears throat> uh, out, of, out of date. And, and then if you take the GP situation, we've been saying for years, we we'll have to have more GPs, we're going to have more GPs. The government announces that we'll have more GPs and the number of GPs declines and in parts of the country alongside all areas of the labour market there's a migration to the cities and to the urban. People are choosing, not only are people choosing to work in different ways in terms of their work-life balance and the range of things they, they do and the way they manage their careers but they're choosing to live increasingly in cities yeah? and younger people in particular mass migration into cities. This is not international migration within countries but of course we've got um, lots of older people who do not live in cities and they need health care and it's particularly difficult I think to you see remote hospitals struggling hugely to get their consultants r r the more rural and remote areas really struggling with their GPs in some other countries people have said rather than continually saying well we'll just announce that we'll make it all right yeah, somehow, and it not do. They've looked much more at what are alternative ways of providing that healthcare, different roles, new roles, using nurses in different ways. And I think we've got quite a block to, to doing that still. And we keep on thinking, if we just say that all will be well in GP land, uh, somehow all will be well in GP land. These are fundamental forces that are beyond most government's control. Yeah, maybe I can just shed some insight on why this requires an act of parliament. This building, I think, was built in 1857, 100 years before I was born. The first medical act the United Kingdom had was passed in 1858. It wasn't passed by, doctors were against it, surprise, surprise. It was parliamentarians who wanted an act of parliament to determine who was a doctor and who wasn't, and therefore how they should practice. We're not laboring under the 1858 Act, I'm pleased to say, but we are under the, it's now the most recent Act is the 1983 Medical Act, so it's 35 years old. Designed for a time, a very different time, when there were about 300 complaints a year about doctors. Now we have 10,000 a year. Society has changed. 
And so we need a new Act of Parliament. You could debate whether it should or should not be. We are what's called a creature of statute. That is how we operate is determined by Act of Parliament. Same for nurses, midwives, dentists. But that's not likely to go away soon. So my, one of my one pleas in the midst of all of this turbulence in, in uh, pressure on the NHS, it's not going to happen with this government with its slim majority, but the next parliament, if it's got a reasonable majority, we need a new medical act that allows us to be streamlined and efficient and a regulator fit for the 21st century and to be far more proportionate and targeted in how we deal with doctors and the health profession because we are laboring under a very outdated 35-year-old Act of Parliament. But we, keep, we have been asking through both the last two parliaments since the 2010 coalition, since 2015, but getting parliamentary time to change it is impossible. And just to add one very small point, uh, we may be showing our age here, thinking about the cohort on the platform and the cohort in the room. There are many disruptive technologies that will change how people choose to use healthcare, how we choose to consult our doctor or our nurse, and many of those are available today. You know, I visited uh, one example. I carry no brief for Babylon. It's a very interesting startup in swanky offices in uh, Sloan Square or near Sloan Square. Uh, staffed by about 250 people who've been employed in the last 18 months since Babylon was started. Uh, all techie people rather than healthcare people, but providing a symptom checker which you can subscribe to or sometimes your GP will make it available to you as part of your NHS service to go on on your smartphone and get immediate advice or if that's not sufficient, they will then arrange an appointment it might be a telephone call with a GP, it might be a face-to-face -face appointment, and there are loads of apps and other innovative technologies like that, which I think hold out the prospect of giving us more choice, more accessible care, and moving us away from the traditional face-to-face -face consultation. Okay, so um, I think we've now kind of discuss the kind of problems that exist. But moving on to how the NHS actually receives the funding, and Anita, you touched upon this earlier, um, do you think that reform in, the air, in this area is needed, perhaps moving to a system of private healthcare insurance or increasing tax, like you mentioned? Well, it's not for the GMC to tell uh, an elected government how much money it should raise <laughs> or how it should spend it. But I could just comment on from talking to other doctors and other healthcare systems around the world. Um, we've talked a bit about the actual quantum of money. That's probably the most important thing because, uh, with one exception which I come to, there's really no healthcare system in the world that's fundamentally changed how it's funded and organised since the Second World War. Prior to the Second World War, for example, my older brother got scarlet fever, my mother had to pay sixpence to get the doctor to come. After the Second World War, there was a huge sweeping change across most of the developed world, recognizing that this was a barbaric system and there should be some pooled risk, whether through insurance, be, uh, Bismarck, or through tax-funded systems through, through beverage. The only systems that have really changed in the Second World War are the Eastern European countries. When the Iron Curtain came down, they went from a Soviet-style health system. So when you have massive political disruption, yes, but in a representative democracy like ours, what's the chances of something that's been around since 1948 changing? You'd have to, as a political, even with a big majority, you'd have to sell it to the population. So that's my first. And my second point would be that, to be honest, if you go to a country with an insurance system, it's not actually that different. So, for example, I'll give you one example. Holland, the Netherlands, has the same climate as Oxford, has the same flu virus, has the same vaccines. Um, they have huge pressure on the healthcare system right now in the middle of winter. Never mind breaching waiting four hours in accident emergency. In Amsterdam, you can wait 24 hours in accident emergency to be dealt with. And when you're dealt with and you need a hospital bed, you may not get a bed in Amsterdam. You might have to go to Eindhoven, 80 miles away. So don't have an idea that because of the funding system's different, it's a pan panacea. Uh, if I talk to doctors in Holland, they say it's a bit like if, you're, if your car breaks down and it's snowing and you've paid your premium to the AA and you ring, I say, I want the AA, I want you to come and help me. The AA say, well, all of our vans are out. But, oh, but I paid my premium. I'm, I'm sorry, we can't magic up more vans. Same in Holland. If they have a, a, a flu epidemic, 
the insurance companies can't suddenly magic up hundreds of more doctors and nurses and hospital beds. So they just say, well, sorry, you <coughs> paid your premium. We're, we're doing our best. So it, it's not that different, actually, in many ways from, from a... Sweden has a, a tax-funded system. It's just it's not income tax. It's local regional taxes. Some countries have hypothecated taxes. But in truth, that isn't... The Commonwealth Fund would say that isn't what makes the difference. What makes the difference is an integrated, joined-up, well-planned healthcare system that works properly. I would say, uh, I, th I think there are a couple of things to think about in terms of how uh, you pay and the growth you see. I mean, leaving the US aside, which is such an anomaly in terms of uh, developed nations, if you look across developed nations, one of the things they do, and Eastern Europe has followed this model ex exactly, it is they, they, they seek to provide collective health care that protects people from the catastrophic costs or of, of urgent need that helps people to be able to continue to work despite cro uh, uh, chronic uh, 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 conditions. And, <clears throat> and they do that obviously because uh, most of the developed world is democratic and that is what is fundamentally important to people and people want to prioritise that. You know, um, uh, my, my granny used to say, and I never understood it, well, at least you've got your health. And I think, you know, older people understand that actually health is a kind of gateway to other things in life, isn't it? It's, mo for most of us, not an alternative to those things. If we are not healthy, we cannot enjoy the rest of our lives and flourish. So it, it, it is an, a priority for people. Um, we do that also, I guess, because we also value fairness in, 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 our, in our society. But also then it's interesting to see what a lot of the rapidly developing economies are doing, motivated by economic development goals. <clears throat> so you know, there's a lot of evidence, obviously, that um, the fundamentals of good healthcare and everyone having, having that are a driver of, of, of economic uh, development. But also, if you look at countries like China, they are worrying that without good access to the protection from the financial risk of healthcare, people oversave. And actually, that oversaving, they, they save so much that actually that money isn't there to support wider development, and that's a drag on your economic growth. So, pooling our responsibilities uh, for healthcare. Um, makes sense, I think, economically, and it makes sense uh, from a social justice point of view. Um, and that good economics, if you like, is borne out certainly here and in uh, all of Europe, where whenever you poll people, you know, the principle of uh, access to care um, based on need and not ability to pay is, is, is of fundamental importance to people. And, and we see in all of the public attitudes work about 90% of the population in, in the UK supports that principle. That's true across all of the age ranges, all parts of the country, across the income distribution, and, it's, and you can't find any real differences across the political uh, parties. So there's no real economic case for changing the basis for we, by which we fund the healthcare system. Um, there's no real social justice case for it, and it would be profoundly unpopular and against the will of the people. Um, so it, it counts for me as definitely zombie policy territory. Yeah. But zombies, as we all know, have a way of reappearing a lot. <laughs> so you were asking about private insurance as well as tax funding, and they're not alternatives. All countries around the world pay for their healthcare through a mix of public sources and private sources. Almost all developed countries have public financing, usually through taxation or compulsory social insurance, as the main way of paying the costs of healthcare for their population. We did a survey with Ipsos Mori recently, and we asked the public, would you be prepared to pay more in taxation uh, to help fund the health service more generally? And around about two thirds of people said, yes, they would. If they knew their taxes, their increased taxes, were going into the hard-pressed NHS that we saw on the 10 o'clock news on BBC last night, they would be willing to do that. That hasn't actually been tried by this government, but I think the pressure is building for that to become a more serious option in future. And as has been said, if you value equity, 
care on the basis of need, not ability to pay, providing universal and comprehensive services as we've expected for the last almost 70 years, there is no alternative to paying through the tax system to make that possible. The Commonwealth Fund surveys ask people in different countries, 11 different countries, if they were deterred from seeking medical advice by the costs of medical care. And we come out best when people respond to that question. A very tiny proportion of people in the UK don't go and see the doctor, don't go to hospital because they're concerned about the cost. Why would they be concerned? We provide that care free at the point of use. Other countries, that is not the case in the same way. Bevan, when he started the NHS, he, among others, talked about wanting to create a sense of serenity by removing the fear of medical care and the costs of medical care. And we've achieved that as a country, and we forget that at our peril. That does not mean to say that all the costs have to be met through taxation, because there is no country in the world that does that. We can have private medical insurance as a choice for people who want to make that choice supplementary to taxation, because that mix of funding will remain important. I so say just one thing that I think we need to, uh, well, two things actually, I think we need to recognise in this though. One is that having a healthcare system based on need and not ability to pay is an incredibly important part of fairness and social justice. But um, what 70 years of the NHS has taught us as well, though, is that it is not enough to make sure that everybody has equal access to good health. So we have a very substantial difference in healthy life expectancy between the poorest and the richest in our country. So the healthy life expectancy of the 20% of poorest in our country now is just 52. Yeah? So, and that is 15 years below the pension uh, uh, age. Yeah? So, so they, you know, people in the lowest income group can only expect to live without significant self-limiting ill health for 52, uh, for 52 years. Um, life expectancy also varies substantially across the income distribution. The gradient isn't quite as large as healthy life expectancy, but it's like 10 years difference in life expectancy. So one of the things that is a weakness, I think, for us is too often we think that because we've got the NHS that we're all rightly proud of, that that's job done. And that having an NHS means actually that you're delivering fairness in health. And we see this probably most starkly in relation to mental health. And, and the fact that people with mental health problems are on average living 15 years uh, less than people uh, uh, with physical health. Uh, they have a lower life expectancy of, of, of 15 years. <clears throat> and so um, we need to, and one of the things that worries me often in, in the public debate, and I advocate and argue clearly that there is a strong case for more spending on the NHS. But what really worries me is where that spending is at the expense of other public services, which have a really important role in delivering those health outcomes and also in delivering good uh, and efficient NHS. So we've seen that most starkly where the NHS was protected from the full force of austerity, <laughs> but social care bore, was in the front uh, line for cuts. Uh, and the result of that actually has been NHS public service of last resort, um, and, and we've got significant problems in, in, in the NHS where we can't get people home in particular um, when they need to go home because they haven't got social care. But if we're cutting welfare benefits, yeah, if we're cutting welfare benefits, if we're pushing families into poverty, if we're not providing decent housing in order to protect the NHS, that is economic madness as well as filling me with fair degree of social justice horror. You know, <clears throat> and so we do have to have... Uh, and we have huge campaigns and energies around the NHS. And again, that's all right. But we have much less 
uh, campaigning about the determinants of ill health. You know, the things that actually lead us to need the health service to the degree that that we do. Um, and at the moment, therefore, my worry is that if the NHS is protected, it'll be expensive for other public services. Now, there is some appetite to increase tax, but this is a really difficult environment in which to increase taxation because the Resolution Foundation are saying now that, that you know, whilst pensioner incomes have risen, for people in work, um, it's going to be, what, 2023? before um, anyone's wages are back, average wages are back in real terms at where they were in 2007. I mean, what that means for, for families is, and I have a child that was born in, in, in 2007, that for a family whose child was born in 2007, they're gonna raise their child on average, they're gonna raise their child without any increase in their living standards. Their living standards through the, ch that ch through, through the childhood, that child's childhood, will actually be below where they were in 2007. Now, where people can't meet their housing costs, you know, can't fund the basics of life, asking them for a ta to pay more tax for the health service is gonna be really uh, difficult. And the ha amount of tax you need to fund the health service is a lot. You know, it, it's not the sort of small change that you don't notice. Um, we are talking about the NHS maybe needing 20 billion pounds. One P on the basic rate of income tax raises five billion. You know, this is, it is broad based increases in tax that we all pay of quite significant sums of money. And that's going to be really hard. The only time we've done that before is when the economy was doing really well and we were saying to people, you know you're feeling better off, could a little bit of that go to the NHS, please? That's a different ask to say, I know you can't make ends meet and life's really tough and you can't see the end of the but could that get a bit worse so we can pay for the NHS? That's going to be difficult. OK, I think now might be the perfect time to take some questions from the audience. So if you'd like to ask any of the panellists a question, raise your hand and a microphone will come over to you. So if we go to the hand um, from the member just towards the right bit over there, yeah. Thank you. My name is Owen O'Donoghue. I'm a second year medical student here and I'm also a member of the NHS Clinician Entrepreneur Programme. So I have two questions, hopefully, hopefully we'll both be quite short. Uh, firstly, I wanted to ask about uh, general practice as a separate course from regular medicine. I've been hearing a bit of discussion at my level about this concept, and I was wondering if the panel here had any perspectives on that in terms of creating a fast-track course that was designed to get people who are interested in medicine into general practice so it was prioritised as a specialty, because we want to create more preventative systems rather than curative systems on the specialist end. And secondly, I wanted to ask about the um, NHS Vanguard programmes, which are small individual studies which are being involved in creating new models of care. And I wonder if the panel had any interesting points to talk about vanguards they were interested in that may provide ideas for the NHS to change in the future to become more cost effective. Thank you. I'll talk about the vanguard programmes. So we've been doing quite a lot of work on those. These are the, what they're called, new, new care model programmes in different parts, different areas of England, which are trying to um, provide often more integrated care, joining up general practice with hospitals, with social care, with the community nursing and other services around typically a population of say 30 to 50,000 and trying to provide more care in people's own homes, providing alternatives to hospitals so we rely less on our hard pressed hospitals in future and prevent uh, patients' conditions deteriorating and providing them with timely access to both generalist and specialist care. Still quite early days, the longest of these has only been going for three years. There's some evidence that they're beginning to have a positive impact in moderating the demand for hospital care compared with areas that don't have these new care models. And there isn't a single way they're doing that. They're providing same day access for patients in general practice who have urgent health care needs. They're getting the community nurses working alongside the practices. They're identifying the high risk 
Members of the local population, often older, frailer, more likely to result in an emergency hospital admission. They're intervening earlier to support those people in their own homes and providing access out of hours for those patients. They're using the ambulance service in a different way. What's exciting about this, and I'm quite passionate from some of the examples I've seen, is this is happening from within the NHS. Uh, the NHS belatedly is giving more power, more autonomy to the frontline clinical teams to say, you know what the problems are, you probably know what the solutions are. We'll give you a bit of money, a bit of time and put in place. So in an example I'm thinking of in North East Hampshire and Farnham, they're doing that with mental health service involvement. There's some very innovative GP practices working at scale. Uh, a network of practices, say, covering 150, 170,000 in East Kent, based around Whitstable, which is doing something very similar. Uh, but there are only 50 of these uh, so-called vanguards across England. We need many, many more, and the best of them, we need to find a way of spreading and adopting and adapting um, elsewhere. So I'll, I'll answer briefly your question about there, there is no appetite <coughs> for training general practitioners in some kind of cut price shortened way and there's two reasons for that. One is your question implies that being a general practitioner is somehow easier than being an eye surgeon or a paediatrician. I'm not a general practitioner but I think it's the hardest job in the world to do. It's very easy to do badly and very hard to do well seeing unselected patients. General practitioners see 90% of all people seen in the United Kingdom both in ours and out of ours. So the, and the second reason is that if you Medicine isn't fossilized or ossified. It's changed hugely in my, I've been practicing for almost 40 years. Um, if you train people to be able to do one thing, if you could train probably someone to do cataract operation in a couple of years, but then they can never do anything else. They have no flexibility to, to, as medicine changes. So they're just stuck in time. And I think the idea of training people very quickly to be technicians, we want lifelong learners who have the skills to change as medicine changes. Okay, um, moving on to another question then. Um, if we go to the hand just over there. Hi there. Hi there. My name's Saul. Um, I was wondering whether you had any thoughts as to whether reallocation within the NHS from, for instance, taking more severe cuts on elective procedures in order to prioritise uh, more perhaps necessary care would be a good way to deal with the strain. Thank you. I guess it's what the NHS effectively is doing at the moment. So, you know, for the, this winter, um, even more than, than, than previously, what we've seen is that um, hospitals faced with the significant capacity constraints, both in terms of beds, but more importantly, actually, <laughs> the staff capacity constraints are, are having to delay elective uh, procedures um, and prioritise emergency. Now, you know, that makes sense in the short term and in the moment, but it sort of assumes that, I mean, the word elective is almost wrong, isn't it? I mean, it, it, it's unhelpful. It implies that these are com somehow, you know, discretionary optional things. And even where sometimes, you know, we're quite, um, you, you get uh, people saying, well, you know, don't we just do too many hips? hip replacements now and do hip replacements on people who don't really need them and much older now and is that really necessary and I would say you know you have to come back and think um, what is the uh, fundamental purpose of the uh, 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 of the system and what are we trying to achieve when we look at um, so not for the very elderly but but even even there um, leaving aside the fact that that I think people sh you know, should be able to live life uh, in a full and enriching way in which mobility is a really important part of that. There's quite a lot of evidence, you know, that um, if people are, older people are socially isolated and lonely, um, that they end up in deteriorating health, yeah? Now, one of the ways in which you get socially isolated is if your hip is in such a bad condition that you can't get out, yeah? Um, and so some of these short-term issues can lead you to compound then some of the, the long-term problems that you're trying to do. So you become 
you know, so socially uh, isolated and depressed and you ca you're not looking after yourself as well anymore and then you get the urinary tract infection and, you have, and you're not physically mobile and then you have the fall and what was an elective hip is suddenly an emergency admission and that doesn't seem to me like the sort of healthcare system that you'd want for people. And there are so many examples, aren't there, in the NHS today where you can identify a very clear need for additional funding. It's hard to say which areas you would cut back on to reallocate in the way you're describing. Mental health would be a great example where there's been an ambition to achieve parity for people with mental health needs and those with physical health needs, but we're a long way short of that. General practice is losing GPs, is struggling to provide accessible care for patients. We've got to find a solution to that. Almost everywhere you look in the NHS you can find examples and we can delay these elective procedures but as Anita's been saying that really is usually storing up problems for the future and it doesn't mean to say we can't do better with the resources we've got. So if you take you know, the example of orthopaedic surgery, Tim Briggs who is a larger than life in all senses orthopaedic surgeon has led a really interesting piece of work gathering data from every hospital in England that carries out orthopaedic surgery. And they've measured um, the intervention rates, they've measured the length of stay following knee and hip replacement, they look at the prostheses that the surgeons use, they look at their infection rates. On every indicator there are very wide and unwarranted variations. And Tim, as an orthopaedic surgeon respected by his peers, would say, don't put more money into the NHS until you've reduced this variation, reduced this waste, and used that money much more effectively. I think he goes too far, and he goes too far because he wants to make a provocative point. We need more money, and we need to address that. And it's not just orthopaedic surgery, by the way. Every area of medicine and surgery would uh, exhibit the same variability. Okay, I think we might have time for one more quick question um, before we have to wrap up. So if we go to the hand just over there on um, the front row, front row, yeah. Um, hi, um, I'm quite surprised uh, that we haven't heard anything about uh, you know, the, the cutting edge of what is actually being planned for the reform of the NHS at the moment, uh, namely uh, accountable care systems. Um, I'm a campaigner who's currently part of a steering group taking NHS England to a judicial review over the Accountable Care Organisation contract, which we believe incorporates an unlawful pay payment mechanism, and it would encourage cherry-picking of profitable patients and it would drive um, £22 billion pounds worth of savings, which sounds great until, you know, if, if it's at the expense of, of patient care, we're worried that it undermines uh, comprehensive care through these uh, cherry-picking um, incentives to save money. Um, so really, um, what I would like to know is, these, the, these accountable care systems, um, at the moment there's a type in uh, Spain run by a company called Ribera Salud. Uh, they've been investigated for uh, fraud, uh, have been hugely fraught with difficulties. Their parent company is now in the UK um, and is um, developing an accountable care system uh, with in, in Nottinghamshire. Um, this company is actually based in the, um, the head office of uh, the King's Fund, um, which uh, you know, uh, Chris Ham is uh, CEO of. I, do we really want an accountable care system for this country, uh, you know, as our as our preferred healthcare system, rather than an NHS um, that is comprehensive and universal? Do we want this Spanish model of care, where, um, you know, in the Alzira model, that is, you know, is so open to 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 fraud, to cherry picking? Um, is that what we want for the NHS? Because we're told it'll always be free at the point of use. But if we can't get, if we can't get healthcare because it's being rationed, um, we will have to take out top-up private medical insurance, and that is not the NHS 
Um, I'd just like to know what the panellists think of accountable care systems which are trying to be um, flown out you know, under the radar without proper parliamentary scrutiny. Sarah Wollaston, the um, uh, head of the uh, Health Select Committee, has asked for them to be halted um, you know, until they've been given due scrutiny. Is that what we want for the future of healthcare? So, I, I mean, we've been doing quite a bit of work on this, so uh, let me try and be succinct in, in response. First of all, we need to define what do we think an accountable care organisation or accountable care system is. And the language comes from the States, doesn't it, rather than from Spain. It's been adapted in Spain from the US model. Uh, it's unfortunate that language has come into the NHS because the way some of these ideas are currently being put into operation bears no relationship at all to that cherry-picking private model that you're describing. And I would be as concerned as you clearly are if that was the intention for the NHS. I could take you up to Salford. I could take you to many other areas across England which um, are not using this uh, proposed contract which is the subject of the judicial reviews and the concerns that have been articulated. They're finding a way of what they're really doing is integrating care. That's their definition of what accountable care means. So bringing together within the NHS, the GPs, the hospitals, the community, the mental health services, often partnering with local authorities and I have to say often these are our labour controlled local authorities in different parts of the country that may not like the language of accountable care but they like the idea of working to integrate care across health and local government and do that in a way which focuses on prevention and improving population health within the model of public sector leadership which doesn't have private sector involvement of a different kind at all. feels to me that's very much to be welcome because it's what all all uh, sort of thoughtful observers of the NHS have wanted to see for some time. So I would want to be on guard against big corporations coming here from Spain or from the United States wanting to win contracts under some kind of competitive procurement process and to take the NHS in the wrong direction away from universality and comprehensiveness and care free at the point of use. But that simply isn't happening in the examples that are now quite well developed in many areas of the country. The focus needs to be specifically on the governments and NHS England's idea of using a new form of contract and going through a competitive procurement route which carries some risk of what you're saying. But actually the mistake NHS England has made is to think we need a new contract. We don't. Integrated care focused on population health is developing and can be developed without the requirement to use that particular route and we at the King's Fund have been very supportive of it because it offers the prospect of improving health within a public sector model based on taxation, based on equity and the values that the NHS has always held dear. Uh, one thing for me, I think, I think obviously the 2012 Health and Care Act um, really uh, codified a market-based approach within the uh, NHS. And I think across the NHS uh, now, most people don't see a, uh, a market, mirroring a market as the way to deliver high quality care that is efficient because they are worried that the, with uh, an elderly population who've got lots of different um, healthcare problems that need long-term care and coordinated care across a range of different um, healthcare services and uh, social care services, that what you need is to get rid of that fragmentation, to look at how you bring everybody together in, an, in, a, in a geography, to plan all of, the per, all of the person and all of the community's care, and to, and to try to focus more of what we do on the prevention and the earlier support that stops the exacerbation. And it's quite hard to find anybody in the NHS that disagrees with that. The problem is that that vision um, is rubbing up against a legislative framework, <coughs> which is fundamentally about uh, a fragmented set of organisations where competition between them it is the dominant model. And the NHS is trying to work out without 
legislation that changes that and that you know there are a lot of reasons to not want more structural reform how does it get everybody together yeah uh, and do that whole looking after a population in a community everyone coming together uh, within the constraints of the 2012 act and i think they <clears throat> i think and then you add, and that that i think has led them to some of these contractual arrangements as a way of getting around that problem which actually are not how you would want to approach it. Add, and then you add into the mix that the funding doesn't add up. And in the same bit of process then, they say then say, so we want you to bring all these services together, look holistically at the patient, but then you've got to make this massive saving as well. <clears throat> and that then distorts what's going on. I think the challenge for all of us is to think, there's obviously, a, do we, if we all agree with that ambition, to bring everything together, reroute it in the community, get everybody to work together. If it's not these ACS contractual models, um, then how do, how do we do it? Is there something we can campaign for, as well as things that we can campaign uh, against? Because I firmly believe in all, the, in all the conversations I have with people who are trying to do this, that they are good people who are motivated by the right goals, yeah, and they want to improve things. They might have been pushed to vehicles that don't work, but they are fundamentally wanting to make healthcare better for people. I think Carillion's quite a good metaphor for this. Um, outsourcing of public services, uh, I'm, I believe, I, people know more than me, it can work where you have three conditions. You have a market, you can measure performance and tell good from bad, and the outcome doesn't fundamentally affect the reputation of the government. So it could work potentially for catering in the public sector. It's not going to work for the probation service. And it could work for some parts of healthcare, uh, elective cataract surgery, but I don't see a huge market for people trying to make money out of children with Down syndrome or older people with dementia. So I think uh, it, it's, it's a very, very difficult thing to carry off that idea. And your point about cherry picking is probably the greatest risk, the selection of who you're going to be accountable for and what bits of their, it's, is, it a, a, your, com, is it a universal health service or is it just the bits that we think are, are, are economically viable? And I think, I think your point's well made. Thank you. Unfortunately, that's all we've got time for this evening, but um, if you could all join me in saying a huge thank you to the speakers for joining us this evening. <laughs>